Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. And right now it's time for Up the Press. We're going to be looking at some stories making national dailies. Joining me to review this is Professor Kamilu Sani Fage. He's from the Department of Political Science, Bayero University, Kanu. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for having me. Okay. All right. So we're going to go straight into it. And this morning we'll be starting with The Guardian. Now, the major headline here says FX crisis, Nigeria falling out of the top four African economies on weak currency. And um, there is a form of chart here. If you look at it, the highest time, um, the highest one here is 2013 and 2014. Um, that was when we had, you know, a good or thriving economy based on our nominal GDP, right? And so I think that was, the, yes, I, I know that was the time of good luck, Jonathan. And then as we go into 2015, 16, and coming into the Buhari's administration, and right now the Tinubu's administration, we've seen a decline in our nominal GDP. Um, so what do you think about us being um, one of the, well, well we, we did not make the top four, and we have one of the weakest currency at the moment? Yes, you see... Uh, since uh, 2009, when the Nigerian economy was replaced, we were the largest uh, economy in Africa. But unfortunately now, uh, Egypt and South Africa have uh, taken the lead, and uh, we are also pushed down by uh, Algeria. So which means, um, as we are talking now, we are the fifth uh, largest oh, uh, economy. From the past, we are now down to, I think, the, the post, rather. And uh, the reason is that uh, our currency um, is one of the worst performing uh, currency in the world. Uh, not, uh, not in Africa, but in the world as a uh, general. Um, we are, after, you know, after the uh, Lebanese pound and the Argentina peso, then Nigeria's uh, Naira is the third worst performing uh, currency in the world. So that is why we have lost uh, the position from being the largest economy to in Africa to now number four in Africa. There's some stories here. Um, we have the presidential candidate for the PDP, Atiku, you know, telling Tinubu, he says, stop blame game, adopt Argentina's reforms, Atiku tells Tinubu. So, obviously, now that we've been pushed into the fifth um, position, do you think Tinubu needs to be talking to other um, countries, you know, talking about how we can actually adopt these reforms and, you know, become a better economy? And maybe that can just push us back up, you know, to number one spot, if possible. There's another one here um, that says um, Nigeria hopeful for positive outcomes um, at WTO, says the minister. Do you think this is possible or do you think this is something that we can see in the nearest future? Um, I think for now it is not possible, but you know we have to remain hopeful that uh, things will be better. That is one thing. Secondly, it's true that uh, what uh, the opposition candidate or other uh, party said is that uh, we should now stop blaming game and look at uh, the problem. We have to take the bull, uh, the bull by the horn. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is what happened. You look at best practices over the world and you try to look at what you have and you come up with a solution. But instead of only promising and then blaming others for the problem, I think if we continue doing that, we are not taking the right step towards uh, resolving our own problem. So I believe and I think that is what the government should do. They should look at... Um, other places where they have done to get out of the, the problem so that uh, we can now tell her it. We shouldn't copy them and we'll take it a straight jacket and put it on ourselves. 
we'll, we'll look at what they do and look at our own peculiarities and see how we can modify the approach so that uh, we now get out, uh, we address the problem. But the most important thing is we should stop blame game and start taking action, uh, not only promising and appealing to the people, also that they should be patriotic, they should be patient. Uh, the end of the light, I said, the light at the end of the tunnel, all these things are promises. We have to do something tangible and concrete to address the problem. You know, we can't be making promises because they seem like empty promises. Um, the, the politicians come in when they want to campaign and they, you know, make all of this lofty ideas and say, you know what, when I get into office, I will do this and that. And then now you're here and nothing is being done. Instead, the economy is dwindling. Um, but if you, were, if you were going to advise the government on certain reforms to take, um, what would that be? Because... It's okay to say we should be patient, but what are we being patient for? Now, the, um, the leader of the Yoruba Social um, Political Forum, um, Afeni Ferry, had come out to say, you know what, the Yoruba should not even join in the protest. Um, people should be patient. Um, the government is working on it. But my question is, what are they working on? How do we know we're going to get out of this and how soon? So if you were supposed to um, just play an advisory role to the government, what reforms do you think we can take for us to have that light at the end of the tunnel? In the first place, uh, coming out to say that uh, Yoruba, Yoruba should not join the protest and that is appealing, I think is uh, tribalizing the, the whole issue. Uh, because remember when uh, Good Luck was in power, uh, when he promised to take uh, uh, the, the, what uh, this present government has done in terms of removing the subsidy and in terms of floating the Naira, it was the same people who come out against it. Uh, they do, does it mean that because it is somebody, that is why it was a wrong policy and not because it is... Our own, then it is a good policy. We have to be patient. I, I think we should go beyond that and look at the problem as a national problem. After all, hunger uh, and poverty don't you know, uh, try ethnicity, gender, and religion, and whatever. They affect uh, everybody. So I think, um, to me, my advice uh, will be first to our leaders that they should not uh, trivialize the issue. They should not see it as uh, on ethnic or a religious line. They should see it first as a national uh, problem. Secondly, the government should now look at what happened. Why are we where we are now and try to address that problem? Basically, we have said this several times that uh, the problem in uh, the twin problems of uh, May 29th, when the government um, I said they are going to withdraw subsidy, and when the government said they are going to plot to the Naira. And these two problems, I mean, these two issues are the thing that uh, break the camel's back uh, in terms of inflation and poverty in Nigeria. So I think my advice to the government will be look at this and see how we address it. Uh, as the former vice president said, we have to look at other places who were in similar uh, condition before us. And what they did to get out is uh, we should also try to modify it and uh, get ourselves out of the problem. But we should not trivialize it. We should not be blaming uh, blame the blame game. We should take action. And so my advice to the government will be review this position and uh, take necessary steps accordingly. Mm. Okay, so we're still on The Guardian, but I want to take a little headline from The Punch because it's in relation to this. And it says, Governors Elumelu Dangote make Tinubu's economic advisory panel. What do you think about this? I mean, you've seen Dangote build an empire. You've seen um, Elumelu build another empire with the UBA group, Transcorp, and you know all of these companies. Now, they've been championing the affairs of successful businesses. Do you think them coming into this advisory panel might just take Nigeria you know, out of the mess that we're in at the moment? 
Yeah, I think uh, we were giving you the expertise and experience, and uh, we should and uh, call people of such nature uh, uh, so that we can have um, uh, you know a thinking group that to now think uh, for Nigeria and uh, try to advise uh, the government on what to do. But to me, I think they will help in as much as they are not made a uh, window dressing. You know, this is one problem with uh, leaders and the, in particular the politicians. They will now call on expert, experienced people and put them as in the committee. But after you know, their own submission, the government will just keep it aside and will not do anything. So if the government is willing and politically ready to uh, take the contribution of such experts, I think uh, um, it is going to be positive for Nigeria. So I think the membership in that advisory committee uh, is going to help Nigeria tremendously. Okay, so still on the punch, and then we'll still take it from the Guardian as well. The the main headline on the on the punch says NLC protests, presidency, police issue fresh warnings as 65 groups pull out. Now, the writers here are don't disrupt commercial activities, vehicular movement, Lagos Commission of Police tells protesters, then protest illegal presidency, CSO's NLC alleged government's plot to disrupt demonstration. And then on The Guardian, you know, you have it as a small headline. It says 65 CSOs withdraw as NLC dares federal government mobilizes for nationwide protests. What do you think about this protest? Um, even the attorney general had come out to say there's an injunction, this protest is illegal, and so um, we cannot have the demonstration, or rather NLC cannot have the demonstration. And the letter was sent to Femi Falano, who's the, um, who's the one representing the NLC. What do you think about them coming out to say this, that it is illegal? Is this just a ploy to ensure that people do not go out to demonstrate? Like I've said earlier on when we're taking our top trending stories, I said it's like having to beat a baby and tell the baby, hush, hush, don't cry. So at this point, what do you, I want to know your thoughts on this. What do you think about them saying the protest is illegal? And the fact that about 65 CSOs um, have pulled out, are they pulling out out of fear? Um, just walk me through your thoughts. What's going on? You see, uh, given the story and uh, given the fact that all over the world, protest is part of the right of the citizens uh, against uh, policies, in as much as the protests are peaceful. I, I think uh, the government position is, has always been uh, trying not to listen to uh, you know, protests like that, but to, uh, to listen to the people. Uh, uh, on Uh, within their so uh, to say that um, uh, it is illegal, and I think this is a, an injunction about uh, two, three years ago. It is not. Um, it is not just on on this uh, issue. So I think that is one thing, and uh, it is dangerous for the government to always try to crush uh, such protests by organized labor. Uh, to me. My thought, my belief is that if the government were to allow such things and the police were to give protection, uh, which is part of what the Constitution says, that they should give them security protection so that it has not been hijacked by anybody, that will now enable the government to control the situation. Because if it is an organized labor, uh, if uh, something goes wrong, the government knows who they can hold responsible. But by questioning this thing, by taking all the measures to prevent it, they are now opening the chance for the public to come out. If the public come out like what we saw during the NSAS uh, uh, crisis, yeah. you cannot be able to control it. That was, that was more dangerous than dealing with uh, organized labor. So I think, well, to me, the government should look at that and allow the people, after all, in their own uh, constitutional right to protest. And the other thing is that um, these groups that uh, opted out of uh, the, the crime strike, 
about 65 groups. If you read the news, what they said is that there are two economies in the labor, meaning they are being financed by the government to come out and break the ranks of uh, at the labor. So that is why I say if uh, one looks at it, one will see the hand of government, either directly or indirectly, in so many ways, you know, trying to uh, throw spanner into the wheel of progress of uh, this issue. By now, uh, using the police to issue threats, by now using the law to say that it is illegal, and now by also using some groups to opt out, these are all measures to break the scene. Like I said, it is a dangerous thing, it is a miscalculation by trying to, uh, you know, muzzle such a uh, legal way of doing things, because like the, the saying goes, he who does not allow peaceful change is now opening way for a violent one. If you don't allow uh, peaceful, organized labor to now work, uh, to, to bend on their own, uh, you know, concern, you are now making it possible for hoodlums to take up uh, this thing. And that is more dangerous for any country if, uh, you know, it is an uncont uncontrollable outburst uh, by the citizens. Mm. Well, I agree with you. I think um, people should be free to um, express you know, their fundamental human rights. Protesting against something is a fundamental human right. And it's okay for people to be able to go out into the streets as long as, you know, it is peaceful, like you've said. And so having to give them that security is way better. But we've seen time and time again, I think sometime last year, NLC wanted to protest and the government, you know, put this ex parte injunction as well, like you cannot um, go out into the streets to protest. I personally have always said it, I do not like protests because it kind of like disrupts the whole economic activities of, of the nation, but you cannot beat the baby and tell the baby not to cry. Anyway, speaking about protests um, or strikes in, in this case now, ASU wants of imminent strike over alleged insensitivity by the federal government. What do you think about ASU going on strike? I mean, we're still talking about the protests from the NLC, well, TUC as well, even though they're trying to like back out. But then ASU as well is saying they want to go on, a, on an imminent strike over the alleged insensitivity of the federal government. I want to know your thoughts. Yeah, I think you see, a strike here yeah, is the last option by any organized labor. And, um, you know, uh, the, the government ought to have uh, head of such strikes by addressing the issue. So I think it is quite uh, unfortunate if we have to allow it to degenerate to the level of, uh, uh, you know, strike and protests. The government, being a democratic government, they have to be sensitive uh, uh, you know, and responsive to the, the, the yearnings and aspirations of other uh, people. Meaning, if there is any complaint about that, uh, the government should address it. Uh, they shouldn't allow it to degenerate into that level. But to me, I think even if um, being a member of ASU, uh, we, I think we, we don't have to go into that uh, level uh, to you know, you go back on the, the strike again. Um, I think we have other ways by which uh, they, we can resolve that task. For example, now if I were to advise the labor, since the government is now out, uh, saying that uh, they are going to, uh, I mean, the police are warning uh, the, the, the labor, and the uh, DSS have done the same, which are all agents of the government, then uh, there is attempt to break the ranks of uh, the labor and so on. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Instead of coming out to protect, uh, you know, I mean, um, sorry, somebody just called uh, to interrupt. So I think, uh, you know, there are so many options in industrial uh, relationship. Uh, strike is just one thing. So there are other ways by which you can make your feelings known, especially when the government is uh, trying to break the, the ranks. So I think they can uh, they sit down at home, 
refused to work for about two days uh, to shut everything. And now we force uh, the government to know that, uh, yes, people uh, they are not happy with what is happening. Well, I think um, <laughs> negotiations are really, really important in this case um, because really the the education of, of the citizens is hinged on this. If ASU goes on strike, you know, people in school, the students have to go home and then there is no studies. So the federal government really needs to negotiate on this to ensure that, you know, the kids, because we cannot, we cannot have no food, we cannot have you know, prices of goods and services being on an all-time high, and then no education for the kids as well. It's 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 just a lot. It's just a lot, and I would I would say negotiations really really need to come in on this one. But let's move over from the whole economic situation of the country, and let's talk something um, a little bit more legislative, which talks about emerging prospects, challenges of state police amid legislative traction. What do you think about this? I know on the show we've spoken about, me and you, we've actually spoken about, you know, the whole state police, talking about if people or the governors are going to abuse power, especially with what's happening with the local government as well. Um, but what do you think of, of this? You know, emerging prospects, although there are going to be challenges for the state police, but then um, it's gaining some legislative traction. Your thoughts? Yeah, you see, the, the issue of policing is very important, um, and uh, it will go a long way towards resolving our problem of insecurity and other challenges. But like I said some other times, that um, uh, the problem is, uh, in as much as uh, you know, having state police will decentralize uh, the policing system, and will make it more efficient and more effective, more responsive to you know the challenges, uh, local challenges. But we have to put it in context. We have to see uh, what is happening in Nigeria, what has happened in the past, and now we look at uh, our own situation with, uh, like we said, the experience of our local government. So by the time you now decentralize the police, I think you are. Uh, of uh, empowering the governors. They now control the, uh, the past, they now control the political power, they will now control the police, and now they will control the uh, parties. If you put all these powers in their hands, uh, we are going to see something terrible. So to me, uh, I think we have to find a way of why you decentralizing the operation of the police. Now, for example, one thing that people advocate of state policing are saying is that you now recruit localized people and, um, and you know, uh, so that they know the terrain, they can be more responsible at this. You can do it that way. You can recruit the people from within local government and state and let them operate by the control, the direction. I mean, the addition will be a Nigerian police for now. Uh, when such a time that this system uh, operates effectively and we are able to address all the teething problems, then you can now uh, send it to, uh, you know, decentralize it to the state. But for the time being, I think let's not uh, rush to uh, past in, in the problem, I mean, the, on the issue, because of what I said about uh, the possibility of being abused by the state governments. Mm. Okay, let's move over to Nature News. And, um, well, there's a small headline that says, Federal Government Justifies Delay in Palliative Food Distribution. And um, as we know earlier, the federal government has said they were going to distribute about 40 met uh, metric, 42,000 metric tons of grains to citizens. But now we've seen a delay in this distribution and the federal government is justifying the delay. What do you think? Yeah, you see, the New Jersey, we, we always have uh, brought a bureaucratic bottleneck on issues like that. Already people are suffering, there is the hunger in the, the country. So I think we, we shouldn't uh, delay the thing. Uh, justification or just fine, it doesn't amount to anything. It may infuriate the people, you know. Already people are uh, starving. So I think the government needs to do something uh, quickly to address that situation. Uh, this delay is perhaps given 
uh, credence to what some papers have said, what some people are saying. But after all, there is no such great. Uh, we had uh, uh, about 33 fellows in Nigeria, all over the Federation, but uh, about uh, 17 of them have already been optioned. Uh, somehow they, they have been privatized or whatever. So the remaining uh, ones that we have may not have the enough st uh, stock of food uh, to now meet this uh, target. And the other thing is, there's huge, besides the huge bureaucracy around it, there's huge corruption. Uh, this 42,000 metric tons, uh, they may not be able to reach uh, the affected people. Uh, some people will cash on that and, you know, hijack the problem, and the grants will be dispersed even if they are available and they will not reach the common one. There's a small headline that says food smuggling, customs to man 1,500 illegal routes with drones. And I know we've spoken about this before, about the security in um, our borders and how our borders are so porous and people just smuggle things in. But now we're seeing that, you know, there's going to be um, drones manning about 1,500 illegal routes. What do you think about this? Do you think, you know, this is what we've been speaking about and finally it's happening whereby our bodies are not as porous as they used to be? You see, manning, manning with drones is, is going to help because uh, we have, uh, you know, like you said, we have a, a very porous uh, borders, so they are beyond the human resources that we have our own capability. But I think just manning it by drone will be able to identify the problem, but how do you arrest it? That is the problem. So I think um, using the drones should be you know, uh, accompanied by you know, mobilizing the personnel and uh, empowering them so that uh, they can effectively man the situation, the borders. Otherwise, yes, we can be able to see what is happening, but before you take action, it will be too late. So I think we need a combination. We shouldn't just relax and say, okay, we are going to use the drones and that's only to solve our problem. So what I'm saying basically is that using the drone is a very, very welcome uh, thing, which will help us a lot but uh, actions have to uh, back uh, the use of a uh, drone. Like what we are seeing, you see, if you look at uh, what uh, the Saudi are doing about illegal uh, uh, this control of their oil pits, yeah, it is being observed, and immediately a problem is detected, action is taken to head it off. But, uh, you know, the, the usual thing, if we don't have the manpower, I, I think um, it will just will be a wasteful exercise. Okay, um, I want to take this final one just real quick before we wrap it up. And this is from the Business NG. It says, federal government says Naira is already stabilizing. Do you think this is true? Because every day we see the price go up. But now the federal government is saying that the Naira is stabilizing. Do you think that's true? And I want to know your thoughts as we wrap it up. Uh, to me, I don't think that is uh, true because what we are seeing is contrary to what uh, is, uh, the government is saying. Perhaps on paper, in terms of policy, they will say it is stabilizing, but on ground and in reality, it is not stabilizing because of uh, the huge corruption around it and because of uh, you know, uh, the, the profitability uh, of you know, operating illegal. And I wouldn't say a big profitability of uh, operating uh, the outside market. And so I think that uh, is a contrary to what uh, the government is saying. All right. Thank you so much. This is where we have to wrap it up on this segment today. Thank you so much for joining us and coming as usual to just share your valuable contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll be speaking to Professor Camilo Sani Fage. He's from the Department of Political Science, Bayero University, Kano State. And we've just been reviewing the papers and what the um, global headlines have been on the national dailies this morning. We'll go on a short break. When we return, we'll be looking at our first hot topics that talk about 
how about 80% of Nigeria's crude oil has been stolen, said by President, um, former President Olusegun Obasanjo. We'll go on a short break. We'll return. Thank you.